We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and welcome to part two of our F1 Team Genealogy series, of which is, that is just the name, uh, F1 Team Genealogy. Welcome. Our F101 team genealogy. Yes. Let's see yes. how many different versions of this we can have. <laughs> so many. If you have missed part one, uh, because I actually forgot to put it up on Instagram that we had posted part one, go check out part one where we talk about the histories of Ferrari and McLaren um, and kind of give you a little sneak preview of what this is going to look like for the next couple of episodes. Um, but yeah, here we are. We are in part two and we are gonna t- we're going from two of like the most successful historic Formula One teams to one also very his- successful and historic Formula One teams and Haas, who is you know not and as much. <laughs> no, I'm really excited. So if you didn't watch part one or listen to part one, welcome to part two. But we are doing team genealogy. Catherine and I kind of like had this discussion offline and online about how teams have changed hands from owners, team names have changed and we thought it'd be really fun for us to like deep dive into this and talk about it, give our thoughts and feels on, you know, past ownership, current ownership, scandals that have happened <laughs> for India. Um, yes. But we're really excited to do this and hopefully you guys think it's exciting as well. But this week we are covering two team. The theme is kind of like two teams who have always been the same team, but they aren't as, you know, historical as... Ferrari or McLaren. So Haas and Williams are our next two on the docket. Yeah. And the other reason why we're starting with, with these two in, in part two, uh, you know, compared to some other more well established uh, successful teams, like the likes of like Red Bull and Mercedes is not just because we're saving them for later on. Cause they're more exciting, but Haas and Williams, just like McLaren and Ferrari are also teams that have not changed hands. Williams is a little bit more complicated history wise of like, you know, their, their start versus their real start. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but technically Williams has always been Williams and Haas we know has always been Haas. So that's why we are starting, you know, here and why we're, we're kind of, why it kind of looks like we're bouncing around the constructor standings of 2024. There is a theme. I promise. We have a a theme. We have a (laughs) madness to our method. (laughs) <laughs> yes, we are the evil geniuses behind genealogy. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, with all of that being said, let's jump in to our first team of part two. I want to start with Haas. Yes. Yeah. So hopefully you guys have been around since Catherine and I did our book club review of uh, Gunther Steiner's book. If you have not, you probably know the, the history of Haas just from watching Drive to Survive. They are newer. So they were actually founded by Gene Haas of NASCAR greatness um, in 2014. But really the like brainchild behind this team is Gunther Steiner. He's really the one that got them on the grid. I highly recommend you read his book or what I did listen to the audiobook because it's Gunther reading it and it's so great to listen to. But you can hear about the entire like effort and manpower that went into bringing this team to fruition and bringing them to the grid. Um, And that happened. Their first entry was in 2016 at the Australian Grand Prix. So it took them two years from like the founding to actually making it to the grid. Yeah. And in the book, he talks about like what delayed them, you know, why, why they weren't on the grid in 2015. Um, But also, you know, more interestingly, why what Gene Haas and Gunther went through to get the team onto the grid as a new F1 team is probably never going to happen again. And that's exactly what we're seeing with like Andretti trying to get and not, you know, an 11th team onto the grid. And we've been talking about that throughout, you know, this season, but like what happened with, the FIA and Formula One media and how Haas came to be is probably never going to be replicated. So even though Haas is not one of the more successful teams, it's still fascinating history and beginnings in F1 as, you know, as a team and how hard it is to be successful. Like they haven't really seen success since 2016. Yeah. And I mean, they are the only 
I'm going to say this in general terms, that they're the only true modern day entrance to F1 because everybody else has been an established team that just changed hands. So they already have their, their foot in the door and that doesn't count. There are no teams around besides Haas that like walked onto the grid and started from scratch in the, in like recent years. I know 2014 is forever ago. It, to me, it feels like yesterday. Time's yeah. hard. But they are the only team to have done that in in recent modern history of F1. Yeah, ex- exactly. And, you know, and, and with that, like, there's not a ton to talk about with Haas in their <laughs> history. Like, you know, to, to skip ahead to, you know, notable drivers. And, you know, they're most if, – if you want to look at, like, from a technically standpoint – Haas's most successful driver, it could be, you know, you you could make the argument that it's Kevin Magnuson. Like, that's... Right? Like, like to, to think that... You know that, you're a baby team when K-Mags is your most successful driver. Right? Like, he finished ninth in the World um, Drivers Championship standings in 2018 um, with 56 points. He finished P5 twice. Um, and he, of course, is famously the only Haas driver to ever get pole position, which was um, at the Sao Paulo Grand Prix in 2022, which if you have the opportunity to look back at that qualifying, you 100% should because it was really... It was not emphasized as much as it should have been on drive to survive i'm just gonna say that no and Um, like was he deserving and earning of pole position no strategically did it work out in their favor absolutely Absolutely. (laughs) yeah and then but like it's just it's so funny to to you know when we're doing like comparative success like kevin magnuson most successful driver their most successful season was you know also 2018 which was k mags and roman grosjean who is most famously known for being the guy who crashed a car in 2020 and it literally exploded and somehow he managed to survive with a broken foot and a broken hand and a concussion or he may not have had a concussion, but he's, he managed to extract himself from the car. It was very, very scary. He walked away from one of the scariest crashes in modern yeah. F1 history. Exactly. So, and their biggest points haul in 2018 was 22 points, which is, you know, 25 points is, is, is a win without fastest lap. And so their best finish was P4, P5 in Austria in 2018, which is the most they've scored in a single race in the history of their team. Watch, obviously their history started in 2016. So there's not a lot compared to like Ferrari, but yeah, Kevin Magnuson and 2018 were there with that. Those were, those were Haas's best years. So Haas has never podiumed, correct? Correct. Never had a podium. God bless them. Maybe next yeah. season with Ollie. Yeah, their Probably their not, best but... their best finish for for a driver was P4. Yeah. yeah, and it's I mean if you watch Drive to Survive, you've seen how many phone calls <laughs> Gene and Gene and got that call Gene. Make. But uh, so this is gonna go way off track, and I apologize to the masses. But this is kind of like building the argument of how they are not going to be successful and like manage to make money at Gene Haas his invest like questions his investment I feel like all the time and so this is like such a good contender for Andretti to come in and come back to F1 like I mean we've talked about this before but us just like nailing out all of these facts it's just like really laying out the resume of like (laughs) why they should be bought Right. Like it, it, it really, you, you have to wonder, you know, just how long or how much longer Gene Haas is going to keep funneling money into this enterprise, this, this little adventure that, that, you know, that Steiner really encouraged him to go on. And I don't, I don't think Ayo Komatsu, the current team principal is going to have as much latitude as Gunther did. And also Gunther was team, like the only team principal until he was fired and, and replaced by Komatsu. So, you know, two team principals, you know, one, one tenure is very long and one tenure has just begun. Yeah. So, okay. Haas has a really interesting history with like Gunther and everything and them trying to get things to work, but they also have like. They've had some very newsworthy and notable drivers. So Roman uh, Roman Grosjean, like you mentioned, he's one that everybody knows. Also, Nikita Mazepin is one that everyone knows, maybe not for the best reason. Um, and you can't speak about him without talking about Mick Schumacher. So for um, Haas, had, they had a full rookie lineup. And they just really, really struggled. And then It was they bad. Up, yeah, and then, you know... Nikita Mazepin uh, lost his seat very abruptly. 
with yes. the Russian Ukraine war. Also, again, highly suggest Gunther Steiner's book. You get a lot more detail from him on this whole thing than you do in Drive to Survive, obviously. But it's really interesting to hear it from like a day to day because that's how his book is. It's kind of like a, a diary yeah. um, format. So you kind of hear like exactly that week how things are happening and what's going on. So highly, highly suggest uh, that read again. But also Mick Schumacher, who's the son of Michael Schumacher, who if you listen to our Ferrari episode, we talked about at length because he's such a you know, histor- historic driver at Ferrari. And then they also have Ollie Behrman, who I know I'm speaking too soon because he's raced twice, but I really think he's going to be something in F1. Oh, I, I, really I, I agree. Yeah, he he's shown a lot of potential. And he's also shown that, like, he can obviously drive a Ferrari and be successful in a Ferrari, which, like, we've talked, and we have talked about this, like, out the nose about how we know that F2 is not adequately preparing drive like rookie drivers for F1, but you know, to so it's it's not like it's an automatic thing that Ali Behrman subbed for Carlos Sainz when he was getting his appendix out and finished in the points in his very first F1 race with 20 minutes notice. But then to do it in that car and then to do it again a few months later in a Haas car, which is fully not the same as a Ferrari and Absolutely also finish not. and also to finish in the points like it shows that Ollie Behrman kind of knows what he's doing and whether or not he will see a lot of success at Haas when he's a full-time driver in 2025 remains to be seen but he still I think is going to outdrive the car similarly to what we've been saying seeing of like Nico Hulkenberg who is not on this list of other notable Haas drivers, but obviously he is a notable Haas driver because he is. Yeah, he holds multiple records for never winning or making a podium. <laughs> also that, yes. So so it's it's going to be really interesting to, to see Ollie when he's in the car. I'm really excited to see it, and I'm really interested into seeing what the driver lineup is going to be like with him and, of course, Esteban Ocon as his teammate. Oh, boy. I don't know. Yeah. It's going to be... Something on the rookie, but anyway, so yeah. getting back to the history, look at us just constantly talking forward of what's happening, like yeah. looking forward to next season. This is only a future podcast. No. Yeah. So looking back, I mean, knowing Haas and who they are, they've had some pretty bad seasons. I would say, I mean, obviously in 2021, they didn't score any points, which is pretty sad. Really bad. bad. Really, really bad. But we're not like expecting a lot from them. Again, they only have so many years of history and they've never had a ton of money to invest into drivers or, you know, building a big team around the car. So, um, honestly, and let's be real 2021, the drivers were Mazepin and Schumacher, who you know, and and to to add to it, which also is talked about in Gunther's book, they they knew that 2021 was not going to be a great season because it was the right. end of a regulation going into a new regulation in 2022, and that and that regulation change was delayed because of COVID, obviously. So they knew that 2021 was going to be a lost year. Did they expect it to be a year of no points? No, no. but. Bad car, focus on the next season, a pair of, you know, for the most part, untried rookies. I know that they both had success in the lower series, but not to the same as like the, you know, the the famed 2019 rookie class of Alex Albon, Lando Norris, and George Russell. Um, That's an incredible rookie class. (laughs) That is an absurd rookie class if you think about it. And the 2021 rookie class was not that. So you know, it's 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 more often than you think that teams score zero points in a season, but it's still not good, especially no. when you're a younger team and you're trying to, you know, establish yourself. Yeah. So with that, it should come as no surprise that, like, they've had a ton of P20 finishes in the Drivers' Championship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, or in, in races in that season. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so we've got, you know, 2016, we had Esteban Gutierrez uh, and Romain Grosjean in Japan and Mexico City, respectively. Nikita Mazepin did it twice in France and Turkey in 21, and then uh, K-Mags did it in Abu Dhabi in 2023. So, 
I mean, at least you could say they finished the race and there were no retirements. Well, actually, there could have been retirements in 2016 because there were um, there were more than 10 teams. So it might not have been finishing last. It might oh. have been, but it might not have. Which I talked about 2016 in Catherine Watched Every Race of the 2016 season, which you can also listen to. And it's linked above if you're watching on YouTube. <laughs> also linked above is our Gunther Steiner book review. <laughs> yes, because we, we just, do have... But honestly, like, it doesn't do it justice just listening to us talk about it. Like, obviously, I think we have good points. We have good, you know, conversation. But read, read the book. Read it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. So... That's Haas. Obviously, we're not going to spend 40 minutes talking about them like we talked about Ferrari and McLaren, but that's Haas. And now we're going to move on to Williams. And Williams is the first team in our series that has a little bit more of an interesting past and like upbringing of sorts compared to Ferrari was established and became Ferrari. McLaren was established and became McLaren. Haas was established and became Haas. Williams was actually kind of, if you want to be technical about it, it came into existence twice. The first was in a um, racing venture called Frank Williams Racing Cars. Before Williams came to existence, um, they were founded in 1977. But before that was a um, failed racing venture called Frank Williams Racing Cars, which was started in 1969 and then became Wolf Williams Racing in 1976 um, when they sold some of the stake to Wolf. Or Wolf, and then basically Frank Williams kind of got out of that venture. Um, things didn't go the way he wanted. He was a little disheartened. And so it became Walter Wolf Racing in 1977, which stayed on the grid, raced in Formula One, um, and then was eventually sold to Emerson Fittipaldi in 1979 and then merged its assets into Fittipaldi Automotive, which was another F1 team, which raced until 1982 and closed its stores in 83. So there, so that was like one branch of Williams. And then you have the Williams that we know and love today, which was founded in 1977 by Frank Williams and Patrick Head. And it was kind of a like do over of this like really bad situation that, you know, that came, that, that Frank Williams came into with Frank Williams racing cars. And like, he's like, let's, let's try this again. It's like and that's we tried what we it. Have. This is everything that went wrong. We're going to correct it and start over again. Over yeah. Again. Kind, kind of, kind of like that. And so the, the, the first um, entry of this Williams racing um, as a team was the 1977 Spanish, Spanish, Spanish Grand Prix. And as a constructor was a season later at the 78 Argentine Grand Prix. Oh, R.I.P. to the Argentine GP. Hey, it might come back, or at least they're going to say that they want it to come back because obviously Franco Colapinto, Williams driver, is currently, you know, on the grid and driving and Argentina suddenly remembers that they're really excited about Formula One now. <laughs> um, okay, so we couldn't do this for Haas because it wasn't in existence is not in existence, but the first win, yes, Williams did used to win uh, races. It's and been a also minute, but yes. Constructors as well, been a hot sack, but they have. So their first, so if you listen to part one, we kind of did like the first win to the actual, what number in F1 Grand Prix it is. So their first win came in 1979 at the British Grand Prix. So it was their 50th race, in the 332nd F1 race. Yeah. Which isn't bad. No, no, it's 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 not terrible if, if you're if you're thinking, you know, how, you know, however long it takes to to get a, to get a win. It's 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 not terrible in the grand scheme of things. Also, when I was thinking about it and like longest and shortest amount of time, I forgot that Braun came onto the F1 grid as a brand new team and won immediately. So when we talk about Mercedes and Braun and all of that eventually, that is a note for myself. But still, 50th, you know, 50th race, not terrible. Better than Haas. <laughs> that is that is true. Haas, Haas's 50th race has come and gone, and look where we are now. Nico Hulkenberg <laughs> still doesn't have a podium. And then, of course, their last win was in 2012, um, which was the Spanish Grand Prix by Pastor Maldonado, who was one of the most penalized F1 drivers on the grid alongside Kevin Magnussen <laughs> and Esteban Ocon. Um, so, so in this research that surprised me is that they had a win in 2012, which again, I know is a long time ago, but it's only 12 years and, oh my God, it's 12 years. I know. Isn't that terrifying? 
Cool. Um, but that's not that long ago. It's no, still it, the it's modern age. Yeah, it it's not, but it also you know goes to show just how different this Williams team that we know now and like the the quote unquote drive to survive era Williams team is compared to you know back in the the, the glory days of the 80s and 90s like I, I just distinctly remember in 2021 when I was being introduced to Formula One by he who shall not be named he, he mentioned he made a point to mention like I want Williams to do well but their car sucks so they're not going to and that's all you know if you're you know if you're not looking into the history of formula one but they had nine constructors championships and seven drivers champions yeah no and i think this is part of again going way off track but like part of carlos going to williams is like bringing back the glory days of williams and like really buying into that vision that james bowles has of like bringing you know wins back to this storied team and I think it'll be interesting to see like again talking in the future it'll be interesting to see if they can come back to the days of like the early 90s like they won constructors 92 93 94 96 97 so like they had a I mean besides 95 like for what six years they were killing it yeah exactly they and it's it's one of those you know, big things. And like you said, Carlos coming really is, is going to that point of Williams is no longer the Mercedes training team and the Mercedes B team, which is really what it's become. And it's great that they've had the opportunity to have good drivers. Like George Russell is doing, you know, decently well at Mercedes. I know he's not your favorite driver, but there have been, you know, years where he's beaten Lewis significantly and Lewis Hamilton is one of the best Formula One drivers of all time and I need to stop saying nice things about Lewis Hamilton <laughs> but they've had good drive Valtteri Botas drove at Williams for for a while Lance Stroll also drove at Williams for for, for a while but that's Lance Stroll but they're they want to get themselves back to the point where they have the likes of like Nelson PK Sr. Nigel Mansell Alan Prost Damon Hill Jack Villeneuve the, you know people who are are these like big names who did good you know did good things while at Williams right and I'm really excited to see like what they do with with that and like the trajectory like I mix like what he who shall not or he who shall not be named said, like I want Williams to do well, but I know they're not going to. Like I think everyone wants to see Williams do well because everyone loves James, and I feel like they're just a team that was like such a family team and so good to be in the sport and on the grid. Like everyone hopes for them to do well. And they're kind of like the little brother who it's like easy to cheer for because you know they're not really going to go anywhere, but you can still say that you're cheering for him but I feel like coming up in the next few years they may be a contender and I know we said this going like coming off last year going into this season that they were going to do well and this second half of the season they're killing it like they're doing so much better and they're doing really well and I don't know I think James who's the current team principal has been since last season I think he's going to do really good things with the team I'm very excited to see where this goes so yeah, no, I, I agree. And then speaking of, of, you know, it being a kind of a family thing, it was a family owned operation for many, many years. You know, Frank Williams, who started the team, he was the team principal from 78 to 2013. And then Claire Williams took over. Technically, she was only deputy team principal, whatever titles um, until, you know, until the Williams family had to sell in order to keep the team alive to the venture capital company that owns it today. And Claire Williams has actually been talking more and more within the last Last few months of what it was like running the team when it was at its like most challenged with you know not you know having pay drivers because they couldn't afford to pay their own drivers and all of the the struggles that they you know have gone through to that led to them parting ways with with the team and like you know we all love you know, Claire Williams being a part of the Williams team and the Williams family and when, you know, when Frank Williams was alive, them them all being a part of it. But it was something that, you know, Claire had to make the decision to, you know, sell the team and also to step away from the team because she did have an opportunity to stay on with them that she chose not to, to you know, take on. Um, but she's yeah, still around. So, so if you guys don't know, like, the fi- like Catherine was saying the family sold the team, but like, 
if they wouldn't have sold the team, it, the team would have just gone away. And they didn't want that to happen. They wanted to keep the team on the grid and keep it alive. So they, like, sold to – so technically there's new owners, but it's the same team. Right, which is – not exactly the same way that, uh, you know, other teams are going to change hands or rebrand, which we'll talk about in the next uh, t- two teams, in the next episode. But it's, you know, it's, this is one of the, like, the big family teams in Formula One. And I think it still really feels like one where it it, it really has that feeling. I think that's something that, you know, James Vowles, who came from Mercedes, where, you know, he, you know, he was part of that, like, rigid militaristic you know type of of i mean it totally toto military would never toto would never <laughs> but it's just like it's a very different feeling from what you know if you look at mercedes and if you look at williams and it also like i'm thinking if we're doing star wars metaphors like you know the evil empire versus the rebellion but i mean I, that that that's only because of darth toto at the very end of that one season of drive to Sur- so of the 2021 season of drive to survive but anyway we'll we'll talk more about toto once we actually get to mercedes in a couple of episodes but i mean they, it's like like we've said, there's a lot to come for Williams, and I think that the new regulation is going to be really big for them. I agree. I think James taking them into a new regulation after being kind of handed down the car, I think will be really exciting. So Yeah, yeah, especially since like they were so on the back foot to begin the 2024 season not having an extra chassis the the drama with like their their new spreadsheet system and like things that were missing with like everything and like that was going on behind the scenes that James Valls had to like go in and change to implement into what he wants to see as as team principal as as he should and taking over for Jos Capito who kind of he came in as team principal when Williams sold the team he, he came out of retirement to do it and he really you know was kind of there just like keep the ship as stable as possible until yeah. they can find the guy and you know James Dallas is the guy now so now we have you know ex- you know this this is their plan and it'll be interesting to see where it goes especially when you have drivers like Alex Albon in the car and staying in the car for now and Carlos Sainz coming in next year and then of course Franco Colapinto who has come in for Logan Sargent this season and has made a splash let's be real I'm um, his number you know, one fan <laughs> you are his number one fan I think he's great and you know whatever he does throughout the next you know the rest of this 2024 season and then wherever he ends up I think he's going to end up as the Williams reserve driver, reserve driver in 2025 yeah. and then until they can get him on in 2026 I've been seeing a little bit more lately about them trying to get him that seat at Audi but I really think that seat's going to go to Botas um, but yeah it'll be interesting to see how those three drivers really take you know formula you know the, the Williams Formula One team to that next step yeah and I mean we can't talk about the good without talking about the bad yeah. Um, so I just want to highlight some of like my personal favorites who have driven for Williams in recent history, <laughs> um, like NBA candidate um, Nicholas Latifi. Yeah. <laughs> and one class taken at Harvard, Nick DeVries. Nick DeVries. <laughs> so we can't forget about these two. Uh, the 27-year-old rookie of last season who didn't last long. Nick DeVries, two seasons yep. ago. I don't even remember when he was racing. I it was last care. season. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, of course, if you forgot, Alex Albon got appendicitis going into Monza, and he obviously oh. could not drive because he was getting his appendix out. It's it's funny that Formula One has two appendix-free drivers, and it happened in the middle of the season. But anyway. Um, and now Nick, they both drive for Williams. And now they're both going <laughs> to drive for Williams. But Nick DeVries subbed in for Albon for yeah. that race. He beat Nicholas Satifi's pants off let's be real and everybody really points that to being the race that got that uh, that led to Nicholas Latifi losing his seat which at the end of the year he was replaced by Logan Sargent who was also who was replaced you know mid-season and then DeVries ended up at AlphaTauri who we will talk about in the next episode which he lasted eight races and then Danny Ricardo came in and took over for him so spoiler alerts there but there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff in the history of the team that is now known as V-Carb that we will talk about in the next episode yeah I just love that like Nicholas Latifi but Nicholas Latifi is another one who like came for money his parents like helped him get a seat you know not saying he's not talented but the money helped 
But now he's just, like, living his life in Canada, like, just, you know, being a former F1 driver. Yeah, the for, former F1 driver, you know, also a family of Canadian zillionaires, like the Strolls. There's, I, th- I knew I there was that much money in Canada? <laughs> apparently. I, I mean, but the Strolls also came from Europe. Technically, the last name was Strolovich. If, if, you, if you look at Lawrence Stroll's um, Wikipedia page. But yeah, Nicholas Latifi living his life, still known as, you know, the F1 GOAT. So, you know, he's still got some stuff, you know, coming for him. And, you know, he he is still referenced. And also Max Verstappen probably still owes him a fruit basket for the crash in Abu Dhabi in 2021. Ugh, Abu Dhabi 2021. Everyone's favorite race. <sighs> Gosh. But I love it because it's so controversial and everyone has a side. It's not, no one's like, oh, I don't care. Like everyone has a side. Yeah. If you have an F1 TV subscription and you have not watched the 2021 Abu Dhabi uh, race, do it. Do it. Just do it. Sign up for the free week or whatever and just watch that one race. Yeah. It's so worth it. Um, and also watch 2016 Malaysia because that <laughs> race is just so good. I just really How love that race. How hard can Catherine push Malaysia? I want to know. So hard. It's such <laughs> That's a great track. Of our, like, of our things of like, can we sneak it in an episode of like, how old Fernando Alonso is? Check us out. Double DNF. DNF. Bishop eating it's, dinner. Um, it's it's just another one of those. Catherine yeah. talking about Malaysia. Um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, so, and again, like, yes, they've had a historical, his, historical success. Sure. I don't, we're making up words and acronym, or we're words. We're making things up now. Um, but as of late, they have not been doing the best, so it should come as no surprise that they have finished at the back of the grid several times. Uh, back in 2012, when there were 11 teams, more than 10 teams, 12 teams, I can never remember. Um, they did finish 22nd at the Bahrain Grand Prix. So that is a... Yeah, Bruno a Senna, point. who is related to Ayrton Senna, he, he has the, the notable distinction of having finished beyond what we know today as the end of the grid. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm excited to see what history these two teams continue to write going into the future, whether Haas turns into Andretti or, you know... Young Ollie Behrman brings them into the promised land of making a podium. Who knows? And I'm really excited to see Williams hopefully get back to its former glory. So, yeah, that's all I got. Yep, that's all I got. Uh, <laughs> tune in next episode at some point next week where oh, we will yeah, be talking we will have about part three coming out. So, part yeah. three will be V carb and steak. Yes, yeah. Get excited. Two really interesting <laughs> teams that do have a lot of like, we're, now we're moving from the teams that have, you know, little to no handover to teams that have a more lot. handover and yeah. rebranding and changes. So I'm we really excited to dive re-brand. into it. Um, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah, look forward to part three coming out. We'll have, we have, so we're doing five parts if you guys haven't caught on. Uh, two teams each episode. So the next one will, uh, will be the Carbon Steak, which will be coming out next week. And That's part four. And part five. TBD when they are coming out. Because life makes consistency hard. <laughs> and Emily's busy. And I'm busy. Yes. Uh, but that has been our part two of the F101 F1 team genealogy. I think I got it right. You got it. Perfect. Thanks for going up track with us, guys.